something that doesn't work is what allows you to shift your time and resources towards something that does. Hello and welcome to Shopify Masters, the podcast powered by Shopify, your companion for starting and building a business. I'm your host, Adam Levinter. After spending nearly 10 years of his life writing and reporting on local and national news, Jason Pfeiffer was given the opportunity to shift his focus and work with entrepreneurs and founders from all walks of life. For Jason, making the leap to editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine was a natural progression, and it became his, quote, wouldn't go back moment. Jason is here now to dive into the relationship between business and the media and share his wealth of knowledge after working closely with some of the most successful founders to date. Jason, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. So let's start out by just giving the audience some background. What initially drew you to want to work at Entrepreneur Magazine? How did you end up there? And how was this different from your previous work experience? Well, it's funny. I think that everybody has a what I like to think of as a zigzag path. You know, we, we don't really know how to control the direction where we go. And so what we do is we ping pong around and one opportunity leads to another, which leads to another. And that's how it should be. I've, I've always tried to be really mindful in building my own career that if I too narrowly define what it is that I want to do or who I can be or what I can learn that I'll miss out on what could be the best opportunities. I, I, I it's something I learned actually from an interview with Malcolm Gladwell. He, he told me that self perceptions are powerfully limiting uh, and I really, I wrote that down. I slapped it on my wall immediately. Self-perceptions are powerfully limiting. Like if you have too close of an idea of who you are, then you miss out on everything that you can be. And so anyway, point of that is that I was a local news reporter. I worked at Men's Health. I was at Fast Company. I went to Maxim. I was really all over the place. And so entrepreneur at the beginning for me was really a media job. I, I there was an opening um, I thought it would be really exciting. It would stretch my abilities as a magazine guy. And uh, and so I took it and I did not anticipate how completely transformative it would be because as I started to spend all my time with entrepreneurs, I started to think differently uh, about myself, about the world around me. I started to redefine my career. I started to shift into what I like to think of as vertical thinking instead of horizontal thinking, which I could define for you in a second. And I found that years in now, I don't think of myself as a media guy. I think of myself as an entrepreneur. And you've talked a little bit about this in your new book, Built for Tomorrow, and this idea of having these four phases of change, adaptability being one of those things. And you know, this Malcolm Gladwell quote sort of stands out for me because I believe this sort of applies here. Oh yeah, it sure does. I, I think that the most important thing that we can do is do great work with the understanding that what we are doing is going to have to change. That the thing that we are most comfortable with, the thing that maybe we think drives our success, is changeable in ways that we cannot anticipate, but that we must anticipate they do change. It will change. It is subject to change. And therefore, how can we start to understand ourselves and our work in a way that provides a way forward? What does that mean? It's all very abstract. You know, I I, I was, uh, like I just told you, I was a newspaper reporter. I was a magazine editor. I still am a magazine editor. And for a long time, I defined myself that way. I, I, I'm a newspaper reporter. I'm a magazine editor. But, you know, the challenge with that is that it's so changeable. You know, right now, if my sole identity was I'm a magazine editor, well, my boss could find my boss. I don't own Entrepreneur Media, the parent company of Entrepreneur Magazine. I don't own that. They could fire me at any time. They could fire me right now, Adam, as we are talking. I could get a phone call and I am fired. And if that means that if my identity is a magazine editor, I am one phone call away from having my entire identity shaken. That's a very bad position to be in. And I think that as individuals, but also as business owners, as entrepreneurs, people need to be aware of what they are that is distinct from, separate from, the thing that they do every day. Here's my line for myself. I tell stories in my own voice. Stories, very important, carefully selected word, because it is not anchored to something that's easily changeable. 
and then in my own voice is the terms in which I choose to operate. But I've talked to, you know, I, the CEO of uh, Foodster is a baking, uh, they started as a baking mix company and then they rolled out all these other sweet goods products. He told me, our mission is to bring joy to people with upgraded sweet baked goods. Right, that's great because if their mission is to sell baking mixes and people lose interest in baking mixes, then this company has nothing. But if their mission is to bring joy to people with upgraded sweet baked goods, there are infinite ways to do that. That very central understanding of yourself gives you an immense amount of flexibility to, to create value and to continue to provide that value no matter the obstacle or the change. So Foodsters is a great use case. Uh, you speak with entrepreneurs all the time. And as we look forward into 2023, highly, highly uncertain economic territory that we're heading into. Higher interest rates, inflation, pseudo-recessionary environment. This is going to directly impact plenty of founders and of course their businesses. When you speak to these founders, how are they thinking about reframing themselves, repositioning themselves, thinking about how to reframe their narrative, so to speak? As I've been thinking about exactly that. I keep flashing back to this moment from the very beginning of the pandemic. It was like March or April 2020. And I was getting a lot of founders emailing me with some version of this question. Is it okay to still market myself? Uh, you know, like, can I still sell a product or service? Can I send a cold email anymore? Because, you know, like the whole world seemed like it was on fire. Everyone's in lockdowns. And, you know, people have businesses to run. They have lives to maintain. And so they didn't know what to do. And I, to be honest, at that time, didn't have a great answer to that question. And so I decided if lots of people are wondering this, I should do something for entrepreneur about it. And so what I did was I, uh, I asked if one of the people who had emailed me, which is a, a woman who runs a copywriting service, if she could, if she'd be willing to get on the phone with a brilliant consultant I know, whose name is Adam Bornstein, pen name consulting, and, and let me facilitate a conversation between the two of them about exactly this. And so that's what we did. And Adam's point, which I thought was transformative, was this. He's like, you know what? Right. And remember, again, March, April 2020. He's like, you know what? Right now, the thing people need most in the world is help. They need a solution to their problem. And we got lots of problems and you're not going to be able to solve all of them. But if you have a solution, like your business is built on a solution to problems, that problem still exists. People need your service. And if you can provide it, and maybe your outreach is going to have to be different now, obviously, but if you can provide it, and you can provide it in a means that's useful to them and that is understanding of their new economic challenges, then you will be exactly who they want to hear from and you will build great relationships going forward. And I think that that's basically the starting point for thinking about how we go into 2023, whatever it brings, because, you know, the thing is, Every founder is going to be worried about, as you just said, like, how are all of these economic pressures going to impact me and my business? But don't forget, you're not the only one. Everybody else is facing these challenges too. Everybody else is being disrupted, which means that everybody has needs. Just because disruption comes along doesn't mean people stop having needs. They have needs. They need people to solve their problems. And they're probably going to be looking for new people to solve their problems because the incumbents that used to solve their problems may not be up to this particular task. And so that is a massive opportunity for you. But it starts by making sure you really clearly understand your consumer, what their needs are right now, who cares about yesterday, what they need now, and how you can make sure that you are there for them. You know, this could be a, a real positive in the world of VCs and raising capital. You know, we've seen valuations at all time highs in 2021. Obviously, multiples that venture back businesses are getting now have come way down. And so, you know, listening to what you're saying, do you believe that we return to a more profit first focus to a more solutions first focus in business rather than founders thinking about when they're going to raise their next series B, C or D? I mean, that was exactly what people said during the early days of the pandemic. <laughs> the, the whole narrative about how VC was going to change was 
that it's it's no longer going to be just about growth at all costs and figure out uh, like a revenue model later, but it was instead going to be about you know profit first and sustainability and a slower growth. And you know, did we see that? I think that probably what we saw is whatever actually happens whenever we make statements about how everything is going to change, which is that everything does not change, but instead everything fragments. And so there are a lot newer ways that some people are thinking about things and different models that people are approaching. And so, you know, you go and you survey the marketplace and you'll find VCs who are still probably primarily interested in seeing user growth and they'll just figure out how to make money off of it later. And there are others who are saying, no, 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 that's not right, the right approach right now. I, I don't think that you'll ever see just like a full shift in a marketplace where everyone stops thinking one thing and starts thinking another. But I do think that these kinds of big shifts create fragmentation and that that fragmentation ultimately leads to new ideas new people in the marketplace, and also people going in different places, right? I mean, you know, one of the, I think, really interesting things that we've seen in the last decade plus is the number of really strong ecosystems in smaller cities around the country. And those ecosystems are driven by a host of things, of, of great talent that is no longer fleeing to the coasts, but also of investors who either are setting up shop there and investing more locally or or who came back home from Silicon Valley or New York and said, you know what, actually, I'd rather live in uh, Des Moines and support the local ecosystem. So uh, who knows? I think that disruption, it can never be a solely bad thing. There are always good things to come from it. Mm -hmm. We saw serious disruption in the world of e-commerce happen over the course of the last few years, let's say, right, was massive surge in demand in 2020 into 2021, then a big reversion to the mean, let's say. Now lots of headwinds continue to plague the world of online businesses. And there are a lot of online businesses listening to this podcast. So I wanted to ask you about that. Um, you know, these unexpected headwinds, let's say the supply chain woes, the iOS 14 updates, higher cost of goods, things like that. Now folks are returning to stores. Do you see e-commerce having a bounce back year in 2023, or do you think e-com continues to struggle? I am allergic to making predictions because people <laughs> are very, very bad at predictions. Disclaimer, when neither of us are in the business of making predictions. Nobody should be in the business. But it is fun. It is fun to forward look and future pace a little bit. Yeah, it is. Like, nobody is in the business of predictions. Everyone is wrong about them. So here's what I'll say instead. I'll say that we have a lot of really interesting anecdotes and data points from just a few years ago when the whole world was turned upside down. A story that has really stuck with me, for example, is, and so it becomes an e-commerce story, but it doesn't start there, is this woman named Lena Fleminger who operates a wig shop in Baltimore called Lena's Wigs. And Lena's Wigs, it was a storefront, and she had run it for many years as a storefront thinking that was the only way in which she could operate this business. Uh, and so, you know, you know what a storefront is. It was people could walk in off the street and they could browse the wigs. And Lena had an employee whose job was to greet the people who come in off the street and, and browse the wigs. And then the pandemic comes along and she can no longer keep the doors open. She, she can't uh, welcome people in. There are lockdowns. She's wondering how she can possibly operate this business. And so the only thing she can think of is something that seemed like a crazy idea before, right? It's not a radical idea, but she never thought it was good for her. And that was appointment only. Go to appointment only. Because, uh, you know, now you only have one person coming in. You can operate that during a pandemic. She had always thought this would be bad for my business because, you know, why would you add more friction to the way in which people uh, shop? Like, why would I make it harder for a customer to come and shop with me? So she had never wanted to do appointments. But now she had to. And she discovered two amazing things as a result. Number one, sales and profits rose. Number two, customers were happier. Why? Here's why. Because you know who doesn't buy wigs? People who come in off the street. They don't buy wigs. They come in and they browse wigs. They're curious about wigs, but they don't buy wigs. You know who does buy wigs? People who are shopping for a very personal reason, often religious or health. And those people are very, very happy to have a private experience in which they are not shopping for wigs surrounded by a bunch of randos who come in off the street. So Lena had been paying because she thought this is the only way to operate her business. She had been paying to have a person on staff who greet the people 
who come in off the street and do not buy wigs at the expense of the people who actually are her customer and do buy wigs. And it wasn't until she moved to appointment only that she discovered this. And once she did, now it becomes an e-commerce story because now she discovers that actually there are all sorts of other ways to serve these people that she didn't anticipate. That in fact, having a uh, a robust virtual presence, which she had not before because she just thought of herself as a storefront, was actually an asset because it meant that she could serve people uh, you know, far wider than her geographic area. And that actually people were very happy to have virtual fittings of, of wigs, which she had never thought possible. And now she does a lot of her business online. Um, she uh, has, in fact, rehired that person, but now that person um, is is used far more efficiently, and um, and you know sort of helps manage the inflow of, uh, of of digital customers, and it has transformed her business. She makes more money and she works less. And I think that versions of that play out all the time, where there is some way that you think your business has to operate, and what you will discover is that actually there are better ways. And I don't mean that like you know, everyone's going to go from brick and mortar to virtual or, you know, or to digital or, or, or back, but rather that as you face economic challenges, you will be forced to come up with solutions that ultimately reveal new ways to create value for your consumer. And that will ultimately shift the way in which you serve people going forward. It's not an easy transition. I'm chatting with Jason Pfeiffer, the editor in chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. So Jason, we're talking about solutions, but let me ask you about the flip side of this. So quitting as a strategy, because I've heard you speak about this and this notion of dating projects and being okay with quitting your startup, let's say quitting your idea, quitting your job. So when do you feel like is the right time to quit? Are there questions we should be asking ourselves to discern whether or not we should be killing a project or killing an idea? Yeah. So, I mean, this comes for me actually from a, a book that I recently read uh, and and then was sharing a lot of, of what I had learned. Uh, by Annie Duke, who um, authored a book called Quit. And Annie Duke is a decision-making uh, expert, former professional poker player. And I I interviewed her for the magazine not long ago and was just really captivated by the way in which she thinks about quitting as a decision-making tactic. And one of the arguments that she makes, and you would reference dating. So the the way that she puts it is, imagine what would happen if you had to marry the first person that you dated. What would you do? The answer is you'd never date. <laughs> you'd never go out and date. And um, and the reason why we are able to find, hopefully, the right person for us is because we can go try a lot of people out and then quit most of them. And she said, look, you just have to think of everything like that. You are dating ideas. You are dating projects. And that ultimately, being able to quit something that doesn't work is what allows you to shift your time and resources towards something that does. Not quitting and just trying to stick it out because you feel like grit will win the day um, ultimately means that you might steal time away from yourself that you could have been putting towards something more more valuable. That is not to say, of course, that you should quit everything. That's not the advice. Um, But the advice is that if something isn't working, that there is no shame in walking away from it. I mean, you know, an example that she loves, which I think is really powerful is, is, um, you know, Stuart Butterfield uh, has a failing video game company and um, decides to shut it down and return his money to his um, investors. And then is is thinking to himself, you know, the internal chat system that this video game had, that was pretty popular. People really liked using it. I wonder if that's a product all by itself. And so he spins it out and he calls it Slack. And, you know, here we are. I think Twitter had a similar internal story. Oh yeah, it did. Like most big companies have a version of that. Like, you know, Nike had a story like that. It's 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 very common because oftentimes the thing that succeeds is born out of the lessons from a previous failure. So, you know, your your question was how do we know? And uh, how do we know if it's time to quit? Annie's recommendation there is to create what she likes to call kill criteria. Essentially, look into the future, say for this business to succeed six, nine months from now, a year from now, we need to be looking like this. We need to be having this volume of sales. You know, we need to be this level of growth. And so let's try to get there and be as smart as we can and commit to 
that if we are not there by the time in which I say right now, then it is time to seriously consider making some very large change. And, uh, you know, I think that's really good because it allows you to establish what success needs to look like, and then it gives you time to get there. And frankly, if you spend a year trying to get to what you know success must be and you haven't reached it, you know, there just shouldn't be shame in that because not everything is built to succeed. Sometimes you have the very beginnings of a great idea, but you're too bogged down in a bunch of other stuff that's not working, and it's time to make a radical reevaluation. No, it makes total sense. You know, you're speaking to founders all the time. I'm just curious, are you seeing some patterns emerge as you speak to these operators as we head into 2023? Are you finding that regardless of industries, there are certain strategies or tactics that these founder CEOs are coming up with? You say, hmm, this is interesting. You know, I mean, if you zoom out far enough, one of the conversations that I see a lot is what some people have just called to me like boring industries or boring spaces. Uh, that the real opportunity for innovation is in places that people just haven't thought of as cool and sparkly enough um, to to really pursue, but that is are desperate, just desperate for new ideas. Um, and so that means a lot of you know new innovation and, and new energy in places like healthcare and transportation and insurance and you know this stuff that just kind of isn't you know agriculture that isn't traditional Silicon Valley um, buzzy startup material. Uh, so you know, that's very interesting to me because you got so many people who who spent the last decade fighting over space inside of the convenience economy, and um, there are only going to be a small handful of winners there. But then you got these really fascinating founders who are, you know, in some rural part of the country figuring out ag tech. The challenge that they have isn't enormous amounts of competition. It's, it's literally just introducing new ideas to a marketplace. And, uh, and I, I think that's really interesting. So I'm seeing that as a trend, a phrase that I, I started hearing from like large executives years and years ago was customer obsession. It's funny how these things move around, but I started hearing presidents and CEOs start to talk about customer obsession. And I think a lot of what that comes down to is making sure that you understand your consumer at a granular level because their needs are ever shifting and to compete, you have to really understand them better than your competition does. I, I have a, a friend, her name is Rochelle DeVoe, and she is a consumer insights researcher, uh, which means that people hire her to go and interview their best customers and understand what they're missing about them so that they can better market, better, you know, better product develop. Rochelle told me, you know, she's like, the hardest part of this job is actually convincing CEOs that they don't know their customer as well as they think they do. Every CEO, every founder thinks that they know their customer extremely well. But Rochelle says that when she's actually hired and goes out and talks to people, that there are these very large gaps in knowledge. Uh, an example is this company Vim and Vigor, is a sock company. It was made, it was started by a uh, an, a female athlete who was looking for compression socks and couldn't find one that she really liked on the market, so decided to make them herself. And her peer group really loved them, and so Vim and Vigor became this compression sock company for athletes. And it grew and grew, and then it plateaued, and they hired Rochelle to look into this and try to understand what was going on. And so Rochelle has this process by which she identifies the best customers, you know, the most repeat customers, the most enthusiastic customers. These are the people who you want to, you want to understand and make sure that you're able to appeal to um, and find then find more of. After her research, she comes back to Vim and Vigor and she says, I got some news for you guys. You are a company for athletes, but your best customers are not athletes. You know who they are? They're people who spend all day on their feet working. They're like nurses. And so 
these people are really buying your socks despite you not marketing to them and really pretty much actively telling them that your company is not for them. Right? Uh, they're, they're, somehow your best customers have tolerated that you don't seem to care about them enough to buy your product. And this radically changed the way that Vim and Vigor operated. They stopped presenting themselves as an athletic company and they started changing their marketing and I don't know, maybe even their, their product development. And as a result, unlocked growth. Yeah. And you've talked about this other use case um, regarding, I think it was Dog Fish Head Brewery, which is somewhat similar to the story you're talking about, about the compression socks, but in the context of innovating at the top, so to speak, having a product that is doing so outstandingly well, and then having the stomach to pivot at your peak, let's say. So Dog Fish is a brewery in Delaware, and any beer fan is going to be familiar with it. And uh, this is a story that, so this guy named Sam is the founder of Dogfish, and I was walking around the brewery with him years ago when he was telling me this. Uh, okay, so in the early days of Dogfish, he put out this beer, and it was called 90-Minute IPA. So the 90 is a reference to 9% alcohol by volume. That's a very, very strong beer. That's a beer that like puts you on the floor, right? By comparison, um, uh, a Budweiser is maybe a 4.5% or something like that. And uh, and then IPA, India Pale Ale, popular bitter style of beer, so, so just for non-beer fans. So he puts out this 90-Minute IPA. People really like it. And then his distributor calls him up and says, hey, Sam, you know, people really like this beer. It's tasty. Can you make a version that people can drink standing up? It's just really strong. Uh, and Sam says, that's a smart idea. And so he makes 60 minute IPA, 6% alcohol by volume. Now you can't have a few and you're, you know, you haven't fallen over on the floor yet. And people like this beer and then they love this beer and then they like need this beer. They like have to have, they like, they're, they are going crazy for this beer. And very quickly, this beer shoots up to become on track to be 75 to 80% of all sales of dogfish. 75 to 80% of everything that this brewery sells is going to be this one beer. And you might say, well, that is fantastic. That's exactly what business is for. Business is for creating a hit product and then getting it in people's hands and making good money off of it. But Sam sees a problem. Sam does not go sell, sell, sell this beer. Sam sees a problem. The problem is this tastes change. I mean, just like we were talking about, Adam, at the very beginning about how we have to operate with the knowledge that the thing that we're doing today cannot possibly be exactly the thing that people are going to need tomorrow. We have to build the expectation of change into the way that we do our business and into the decisions that we make right now. Sam realizes that, yeah, he could allow this beer to become his runaway hit. He could make a lot of money on it right now. But the problem is that when tastes change, and they will, perception of his company will change too. Because right now, he could be a hot IPA brand because that he's got a hot IPA beer. But if everyone goes into bars and liquor stores and wherever, and the only time that they ever see dogfish is because they see this one beer... It'll be a hot IPA brand up until the moment in which tastes change, and then he stops being a hot IPA brand, and he starts to become an old brand, and that is death. So Sam makes a decision, and the decision is this. He is going to cap sales of his best-selling product at 50%. It was on track to be some, become 75 to 80% of all sales. He is capping it at 50%. This is not some like some limited edition hot Instagram drop, right? Like this isn't, he's not playing that game. He is literally just throttling availability of his best-selling product because he does not want it to define him. Now, this means that people are furious at him, furious. They're screaming at him on the streets of Delaware. I have walked around Delaware with Sam. Sam is Beyonce in Delaware. People are taking selfies with him. They, they love him. They're screaming at him. And the reason they're doing that is because, you know, they they run a restaurant and it's a local restaurant and people come in, they want the hot local beer and the local restaurant doesn't have the hot local beer and it's embarrassing. And Sam uh, is, is getting yelled at. And I asked him, were you ever worried about this? And he said, no, because there was literally no other option. Like there just wasn't another option. The only other option was to let this beer define him and therefore to limit the like the lifespan of his company. So instead, whenever people called for 60-minute IPA and it wasn't available, 
uh, he or his team would say, we're really, really sorry. We we work to make it incredibly fresh and we're trying to keep up with demand, which is sort of half a lie. Um, but in the meantime, why don't you try out other styles of beer? Why don't you try our Saison or a pumpkin ale and turn it into an educational opportunity? And the result of this is that he gets a wide variety of his beers out into the marketplace. And he shapes perception of Dogfish not as an IPA brand, but rather as an innovative brand. And as a result, a couple of years ago, he sold this company for $300 million, which is not something that you can do with an old brand, but it sure is something you can do with an innovative brand that people love. I love this idea of of building change into the business model. It's so insightful. Hope you're enjoying our conversation. If you haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your audio. Leave us a review or feedback for the show. It certainly helps us discover our audience. I'm chatting with Jason Pfeiffer, the editor-in-chief at Entrepreneur Magazine. Jason, what about those who are interested in building the media into their business model next year? How should they be approaching or thinking about using the media to their advantage? What do they understand and what do they get wrong? Oh my God, this is a rich subject. Uh, (laughs) Here's what entrepreneurs get wrong. It starts with this. People think of the media as a service provider and that the service that we provide is coverage for your business. And that's the reason why I get lots of emails that are phrased like this. How can I get a feature in Entrepreneur Magazine? I would like a feature in Entrepreneur Magazine. How can I go about that? You have to understand that media is not a service provider, that the people who work at a media organization are not thinking of themselves as being there to support you. They are not. Their job is not to care about you. Their job is to care about their reader or their listener or their viewer. So instead, you have to understand exactly what it is that they want and that they do, and then frame yourself as an opportunity to them. At Entrepreneur Magazine in particular, we think of ourselves not as a business magazine, but as a thinking magazine, which means that what we're really interested in is how have people thought through problems? How have they made counterintuitive decisions that led to significant results such that other people can read these stories and say, aha, that is really insightful. I know exactly now a different way that I can think about my own business. I think that's a great place to end it in amazing insights. Thanks, Jason. Thanks. That's Jason Pfeiffer from Entrepreneur Magazine. He's got a book coming out called Built for Tomorrow. You can look for that on Amazon or wherever you get your books. I'm Adam Levinter. I'll catch you next time on Shopify Masters. 